Hello, and welcome to the Multilingual World Podcast. If, like me, you're fascinated by language and languages, you've probably asked yourself questions like, how multilingual is the world? Where are the world estimated 7,000 languages spoken? And which countries have the lion's share? How is this wealth of linguistic diversity managed by individuals, groups, and governmental authorities through language policies and what are the consequences of such choices? Why do people stop speaking and transmitting their heritage languages and shift to dominant languages? What can we do to stop the 60 to 90% of the world's languages from disappearing? To explore these questions and many more, I will be interviewing influential academics and multilingual speakers living in Manchester to discuss aspects of multilingualism in different parts of the world, dispel the myths of inferior and primitive languages, and most importantly, we will discuss how language science contributes to improving access to better education and health, and how central it is to socioeconomic development and to fight social inequalities. I'm Dr. Serge Sanya. I'm a lecturer in linguistics at the University of Manchester, and I'm very excited to welcome you to the Multilingual World Podcast. Now, today I'm joined by Gabriela Perez Baez. And um, Gabriela is an associate professor of linguistics at the University of Oregon. Good afternoon or good evening, or maybe good morning. Yeah, good morning over here. Thank you for the invitation to join you. Can you say a few words to introduce yourself before we start? Sure. Yes. Um, yeah, indeed, I'm currently at the University of Oregon, which is on Kalapuya land. Uh, Kal the Kalapuya are the um, ancestral peoples of this region who remain in this region in uh, various uh, communities such as the uh, Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. Um, I am, however, uh, from Mexico, from the from Mexico City, and I became a linguist because I wanted to contribute in some way to the sustainability of linguistic diversity back home in Mexico. Um, I was born and raised there at a time when um, there was very little understanding of the value of linguistic diversity, and more importantly, there was very little understanding about linguistic rights. Uh, things have been changing for the better, I think. Um, and yeah, one one big decision I made in my life was to become a linguist, to leave behind a career in graphic design and, and become a linguist so that I could uh, contribute more directly to um, language sustainability back home in Mexico. Nice. Do you, do you use your skills of a graphic designer in linguistics? Um, my PowerPoint slides tend to be prettier than okay. other people's, but <laughs> but uh, but Nothing more yes, than that. that right that that career did stay behind. So tell me very quickly for those who don't know the Mexico scene, how many uh, languages roughly are spoken in Mexico? So Mexico, um, the southern half of Mexico. Um, and a little bit into uh, Central America is known as Mesoamerica uh, by anthropologists and linguists, and it's a region of tremendous diversity. Um, so there's a huge concentration of um, languages belonging to different to 11 different language families, uh, and that number includes uh, three isolates as well. Uh, but there's a ton of languages there uh, to the point where we don't know an exact number or even a ballpark, uh, probably in the vicinity of 300 languages. And of course, there's languages also uh, north of that region in the northern half of Mexico. Um, so yeah, so Mexico is one of the uh, nation states with greater linguistic diversity and therefore, in my view, with greater responsibility to sustain that diversity. And the dominant it's, language is Spanish. Yes, yeah, so that's the, uh, so Mexico uh, saw a lot of uh, European presence, not only of Spaniards, Italians, French, 
in particular, um, Spanish became a dominant language, especially when Mexico gained independence from Spain um, in the early 1800s, the first half of the 1800s. Um, and so Spanish was imposed as the language of education, even though Mexico has a very, what can be considered as progressive um, legislation to protect linguistic rights. There's a Ley General de, Le de Derechos Linguísticos, so a general law of linguistic rights uh, in place since 2007, I believe. Um, things only started changing in the last you know, 10, 15 years. And there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to ensure that um, members of indigenous peoples can access services in their own languages, services such as healthcare services or education in their own languages. There's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but okay, yeah, so, the, so the, the dominant language there that um, has displaced uh, indigenous languages is Spanish. That's the official language of the country. Well, there's no official language um, ah. uh, or national language. The constitution recognizes um, all indigenous languages, uh, Mexican sign language, and also uh, Spanish all as national languages. Okay, I was going to say it's basically almost de facto the official yeah. language because it's the language of government business and uh, education, right? Correct. So you live yeah. in the United States. Yes. How, what is the uh, the scene, the linguistic scenes there in terms of indigenous languages? Usually when people think about the United States, they think about English. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So what yeah, is the same reality? thing. So it's a similar, uh, English has a similar situation here in that it has been the imposed uh, European language. It is not an official language or a national language at a national level. Um, it is an official language in some states, but very few. By um, law. I'm sorry? By law, I meant. By law. There is yes, a law that is. states. There's a yes. law that states that English is the official language in this specific state. Right, in a couple of states. In a um, couple of states. But at a national level, there's no official or national language. Um, this region of the continent is historically an incredibly linguistically diverse region. Um, tons of languages to a number. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the actual numbers uh, on hand but um, a very large number of language families. So in fact, um, in terms of uh, the number of language families, it is more diverse than even Mexico, um, despite the Mesoamerican concentration of languages and cultures. Um, the, nor the Western coast region of the US is especially dense in terms of the number of languages and the number of language families. Um, the big difference is that uh, genocide and uh, policies such as the boarding school policies um, of the late 1800s and first half of the 1900s really decimated um, the indigenous communities in term and, and affected the vitality of the languages to a great extent. So whereas in Mexico, we still see uh, many languages that are vital, meaning that children are learning the languages. Um, there, there's definitely a lot of um, language shift. There's a lot of language endangerment, a lot of languages that are only spoken by elders or by adults uh, in the best case scenario. Um, the language shift is much more advanced in the United States. So we see a lot of languages, most languages, uh, perhaps with the exception of Hawaiian or Navajo, Mohawk, Cherokee, um, most languages are only spoken by elders. And there is a large number of language communities who are revitalizing languages after a period of dormancy. So after a period of decades, um, without native speakers of their language. So they are revitalizing based on uh, historical archival research. 
So it's a very okay. different scene, still a ton of diversity, uh, but much more advanced endangerment, which requires a different approach when it comes to revitalizing languages. We'll come back to the issue uh, on uh, boarding schools in a, you know, in a few minutes. But, you know, if we look at um, the current situation in the States, are there laws to protect, you know, minority languages or maybe endangered languages? Are there laws in place? Um, there are, uh, so in the early 1990s, the uh, Native um, American Languages Act uh, was passed and remains in force. And this specifically gives control to um, indigenous communities over um, who teaches in their schools and what the curricular activities might be in their schools. And in particular, um, it opens the door for greater control by the communities to have language revitalization activities in the school system. There is no um, linguistic rights law at a national level per se. Uh, there are uh, laws that protect uh, linguistic rights in very specific domains, for instance, in the justice system or in the healthcare system where a, a provider of uh, healthcare or a court system is obligated to provide interpretation um, to members of uh, minoritized language communities. But then it's, it's all very fragmented. There's no overarching statewide or, um, or nationwide uh, law of linguistic rights. Yeah, I think the, the issue of uh, indigenous languages and access to services is a global phenomenon as is the issue of, uh, you know, language endangerment, right? Sure. So the UN has uh, declared 2022 to 2032 the international decade on indigenous languages, right? So yeah. in your view, what can we do, you know, as um, uh, people, as users of languages, to foster uh, sustainability, language sustainability, you know, whether we belong to majority or minority communities? Yeah, that's a great question because it's very important to recognize that the, the work, and if I can call it the burden of uh, protecting uh, the vitality of a language, uh, should not only fall on the language, on the members of the language community, but it should fall on everyone because the pressures to shift away from a, uh, a community language come from outside the community and come from uh, majority uh, societies. So it's very important that we understand that when we, um, that language shift Language endangerment obeys um, situations where access to basic rights, access to basic services, again, such as justice, healthcare, um, the ability to get your uh, birth certificate, for instance, in your own language, um, education, when all of those basic services that humanity has recognized as basic rights uh, are contingent upon whether you use a majority language, um, then we're violating the very human rights of individuals. So we need to understand that there is no inherent value uh, or inherent greater value of one language over another. Uh, languages have the value and the prestige that that individuals give to that language. And so, therefore we have the power to say that all languages are equally valuable and all languages should allow us to access the right, the, the services that will uh, help a community and an individual secure um, a basic quality of life. So yes, yeah, so, so why is it important to uh, maintain linguistic diversity. You were talking about the value of uh, you know, uh, all languages. So you were saying that all languages have value and that the value is given to languages by the speakers, right? 
But what we know is that, you know, when, it, when language shift happens, uh, it's often because the value of one language dominates, you know, over the value of another one, right? Often it's like a majority language against a minority language. So, and you would hear people say, why don't we all speak the same language? That would mean, why don't we all shift to a majority language, for example, and be happy. So communication will be easier and we will have less problems. Right. What do you think? Right. Well, what so would you think of that? Um, well, life for nurse is about diversity, right? In in the natural sciences, we have recognized without a doubt that the more diversity in flora and fauna, the more stable and resilient an ecosystem will be. Um, humans are also incredibly diverse because we, we are part of the natural world. Um, and we're diverse, humans are diverse uh, in their cultural practices in how they learn uh, and how we interact with our environment and how we communicate. We communicate through language, which seems to be unique to um, uh, Homo sapiens. But we, um, we are diverse in how we have structured the linguistic systems. Um, that means that every single language out there, oral or signed language, uh, belonging to a majority or a minority uh, community, is a language that has allowed a community to uh, survive over centuries or even millennia. Um, because it has allowed for optimal communication within that community um, that has strengthened the community, kept it cohesive, and, and, and allowed cooperation between its members. So we need to recognize that. And we need to recognize that uh, when we talk about a different value um, given to languages, it is given uh, on the basis of a very discriminatory. Um, practices towards minoritized peoples. In other words, the language in and of itself doesn't have more or less value than another. Languages are used as instruments of discrimination. And, and that is what um, will drive communities away from their language. That's what will be interpreted by members of a minority uh, community as if their language were of lesser value, and that's what strengthens the perceived value of, domin uh, of dominant languages. So again, we just need to be very mindful and honest in recognizing that languages are used as instruments of discrimination. I think the other uh, side of this, just to build up on what you were saying, is that, you know, no language has the monopole of science or the monopole of like you know knowledge or experience of the world so wherever people have lived they have developed you know knowledge about uh let's say medical knowledge mm -hmm. right? knowledge about plants for example you know how they use them to uh, uh produce medicine you know how they produce their own food so the agricultural system that they you know developed over centuries you know, how they adapt to the, how they basically adopt the environment and adapt, you know, over, you know, time. And also the environmental knowledge that, you know, different peoples develop over time, right? Today we're talking about saving the environment, but are we really taking into account that kind of knowledge that has been developed all over the world by communities, however small they are? that reflects you know one experience one portion of uh, the experience of humans so in that sense i agree with you but that's not a message that you know um, uh, non linguists were even people who are not inter who are interested in um, uh, languages or endangered languages actually you know usually have so i guess we have work to do to you know, to convey that message to the general public. Absolutely, and I think yeah. also, And I think also that, you know, a decade for uh, an international decade on indigenous languages is hopefully going to help, you know, to raise awareness on these kind of issues. Mm 
Sure. Yes, um, I think we're all, at least we meaning linguists like you and I, are very excited about the uh, International Decade of Indigenous Languages. Uh, but linguists are not the only ones who should be involved. Of course, uh, the decade um, came about because of the involvement uh, because of the International Year of Indigenous Languages, right, in 2019. Um, and that was an initiative by um, Bolivia and Ecuador, uh, if I remember correctly, as member states of the UNESCO. And it was a, an initiative within those countries by members of Indigenous communities from those two nation states. Um, so we need to be um, we need to recognize the leadership, the stewardship, the involvement of, of members of indigenous communities to make us all aware that um, their rights have been violated for so long. And by recognizing, by taking 10 years to um, do something concrete to change that, um, to repair that damage, and to be better commun international community moving forward. Um, I, but, the, but the action needs to be concrete, right? We can talk a lot about uh, the value of this and the need for that, uh, but we need very concrete steps. Um, it would be my hope, for instance, that out of this decade, um, the world would come out with a declaration, universal declaration of linguistic rights, for instance, that links language not only to culture, but to human rights, to make sure that moving forward, um, healthcare services are broadly offered in as many languages as possible. That means that if, you know, generating capacity in communities so that healthcare systems from communities and healthcare systems from outside communities are working together. There's great examples, for instance, in Mexico, where the uh, state-run healthcare system works with um, traditional uh, medicine people from a community, both in the same health institution, both running uh, the services in Spanish and the local language. There aren't many cases uh, like that, but that is- That's amazing. That is amazing. And I hope that we will see more of that. But also, again, I hope that um, these kinds of rec uh, initiatives that recognize the value, like you said, of knowledge or of language uh, and of human rights um, are encoded in some kind of instrument at a national level and international level so that we're- so that we're not questioning, uh, we're not raising these questions anymore so that it, it is established and it's agreed upon at a broad international level that um, re linguistic rights are human rights. Yeah. So let's talk about the International uh, Mother Language Day. Mm -hmm. Now, every year uh, since 1999, uh, we celebrate the International Mother Language Day on the 21st of February. And that's an initiative that came from Bangladesh. We were talking about an initiative from uh, Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And what's the other country? Was it Guatemala? Ecuador. Ecuador, Ecuador. Ecuador. Bolivia and uh, Ecuador, building from the International Mother Language Day, right? And the International Mother Language Day is a day that is um, basically put in place to celebrate linguistic and cultural diversity. You know, by the by the UN. Now the theme for this year is multilingual education, a necessity to transform education. So uh, the first question I have here is how multilingual is the geographical uh, area? You know uh, where you do your research is. You mentioned it a bit when you talked about Mexico and uh, uh, the United States. But I wanted you to comment on, you know, the contact between different peoples, mm -hmm. you know, language speakers, different language communities, if you will. Sure. Yes, so that's a very broad question. Let me uh, take a little piece at a time. Um, so back home in Mexico, my focus has been on um, Zapotec communities. 
mostly concentrated in the state of Oaxaca um, with a few communities in the state of uh, Veracruz, but that's essentially the, uh, the, south, the south of Mexico. And there's a tremendous diversity. There's probably at least 50 different uh, Zapotec languages. Um, but they're in the middle of Mesoamerica, so in contact with um, a number of other uh, languages from other um, branches of the Ottoman language family, but also in contact with languages from other completely unrelated language families. Um, and the contact situation is different depending on the region uh, where people are. So uh, Zapotec languages are spoken roughly in five different geographic regions. There's the Northern Sierra, the Southern Sierra, the Central Valleys, uh, the Western region, and the uh, Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Um, I have worked mostly in the um, Central Valleys and the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, and the contact is different. Um, for example, in the Isthmus of the Tehuantepec, speakers of Dijaza, which is the Zapotec language I work most with, um, are in contact with speakers of Zoke languages. That's a completely different uh, language family. They are in contact with speakers of Wave as well, um, completely unrelated um, language. Uh, and they have been in contact with European languages for a very long time. Uh, the Isthmus of Tehuantepec is where Mexico narrows down, uh, narrows in in uh, in mass, in land mass. So Europeans would cross uh, from um, the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico through that narrow band of uh, land. Um, so they. Uh, speakers of Dijaza have been in touch and, or in contact with speakers of French and Italian and Spanish and also Chinese. Um, so mm. this is uh, in the 1800s and probably well into the 1900s. Um, and, and anybody else who, you know, sailed by the Pacific coast in that region. Um, so tremendous um, language contact um, over the last few centuries, at least. Um, now, in terms of what that means for education, what is relevant is that education needs, uh, so UNESCO has been very involved for many decades in showing um, through research the importance of offering mother language education to children on grounds that if, if scholarly subjects are presented to children in the language or languages that they use from uh, through their upbringing, then that um, the learning of, the learning experience will be infinitely more productive. Uh, and beneficial to the child. What happens in most situations where there's a dominant language and um, schooling is offered uh, using that dominant language as language of instruction it, is that children are, that language is imposed on, on children um, at a in a way that does not allow for the child to acquire that language adequately. Um, in order to be able to derive the benefits of that schooling experience. And in fact, not, not only is it uh, suboptimal for the learning experience, but it becomes a violation of their, uh, of their human rights in that, for instance, uh, these children will be evaluated uh, on the imposed language without the child having enough time to acquire that language. And this happens um, in, in, situation, in post-colonial situations or contexts, plenty of context uh, and examples to draw from, uh, from African context, right? Uh, it happens throughout the uh, American continent. Um, and, and it happens throughout the world, essentially. Um, it happens in, in, in migration contexts. So for instance, in the United States, what we see, for example, in Oregon, which, which is where I live, um, the, the farming, the logging, the food packing industries 
are um, the the labor that's fueling these industries comes from um, Mesoamerica primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, which means that these are industries powered by speakers of indigenous Mesoamerican languages. Um, they, their children will attend schools um, where English is the language of instruction. Um, they will be assumed to be speakers of Spanish because they come from Mexico and they come from, or they come from Guatemala, for instance, and they are evaluated um, on grounds of their proficiency in English. There are programs in place to bring them up to speed on the use of English, but those programs at best are designed for Spanish speakers and not for in speakers of a diversity mm -hmm. of indigenous languages. Um, fortunately, over the last few years, the Oregon Department of Education has recognized this need and they have been working with the lab that I run at the University of Oregon, the Language Revitalization Lab, to change their registration system so that these families can register the indigenous language that they use as opposed to Spanish, if that's not a preferred language, um, so that the school is aware that this is a family of indigenous origin, where Spanish is not a language of use in the home unnecessarily, and can attend to the needs of those children. And, and it matters, for instance, in something as serious as diagnosing speech disorders, because a child who's a speaker of any indigenous language from, let's say, the south of Mexico, if that child, uh, if it were, um, if if a speech language pathologist were suspicious of that child having a, uh, a speech disorder, but that child is um, evaluated as if they were a speaker of Spanish, Spanish. that can lead. And it has been documented that that error leads to a lot of misdiagnosis that will channel a child through special education without that being a need for the child. What the child needed was recognition of their linguistic inventory uh, growing up. Um, so again, um, I've gone through a bit of a rabbit hole just to um, bring back the notion that Awareness of the value of multilingualism is critical for the, um, the, the schooling performance, the academic performance of the child, um, the, and for, the, for proper delivery of school-related um, services, and ultimately, again, for the respect of um, their rights as, as individuals, as humans and have benefits as you mentioned right right and uh, what you were saying about uh, the use of um, languages that children do not understand in education is mm -hmm. certainly you know my experience and the experience of most children even right now you know uh, in most african countries so for example in francophone countries you know we go to school i mean when i was growing up uh, most children came to school with at least two or three languages, right? And the language right. of schooling, the medium of instruction was French and you had to speak French. You couldn't speak another language. You were punished for, you know, uh, speaking another language. So, you know, it's the language of evaluation which means mm -hmm. that, you know, the children do not understand sometimes the question that they're being asked. The rate of dropout, you right. Know, it's Absolutely. much higher when, obviously, you know, when you're in a situation where, you know, the school, you know, the language of schooling, you know, is not a language that children understand. And uh, the other thing is that people get out of the education system with a complex of inferiority because the language, like mm -hmm. the language like French, the medium of instruction becomes the language of uh, intellectual evaluation. So if you right. leave the school without mastering the language, it's your intellectual abilities that are right. basically being evaluated. That means you're dumb. You left school because you're not intelligent enough to stay in school. Absolutely. And right. people live with that kind of self-evaluation and it follows mm -hmm. them throughout life. So it's a yes. big issue, right? Sure. But to come back to multilingual education, are there programs 
on multilingual education, like put in place in the areas where you're working, or maybe people are still working on monolingual education using indigenous languages when they are used? Um, that's a great question. Um, in Mexico, it depends a lot on um, the extent to which a community uh, and a, so the education system in Mexico is very complex. Um, the standards are set at a national level, but there are teacher unions uh, at a more local state level. Uh, and even within that state, there might be a couple of different teacher unions, and they uh, take on different approaches to education. Uh, so depending on um, the particular position that a teacher's union might take and the interest in, of a community to incorporate language, the indigenous language into the schooling, um, that's what will determine the extent to which the, the language is incorporated with the extent to which um, education will be bi bilingual, uh, bicultural, or plurilingual and pluricultural. By law, that's how language, uh, I'm sorry, that's how education should be in Mexico, but it doesn't always happen. Um, the development of uh, pedagogical materials is um, a challenge that has not been addressed adequately yet. That's why you need um, so linguists. That's partly why we need linguists, but we also need partnerships between linguists With and educators, and right? Educators, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because yeah. we can provide... Of education. Right, we can I mean, provide... I the... linguists. I, I brought in linguists because you need linguists to describe the languages, yes, right? Yes, exactly. You know, right. To describe the phonological system, to produce orthographies, you right. know, to produce grammar books, dictionaries, you know, and other support material. But you also need like specialists of education yes. and practitioners to be like, you know, there to help produce the adequate material that children can use. Sure, absolutely. And the other thing is that um, the, the institutionalized education systems tend to value the written language well over the oral okay. or signed language. Um, and so, you know, children are able to acquire any language that they are exposed to through socialization to the point where they have, they can be effective communicators and they can use uh, whatever language, whether signed or oral, in, to fulfill their communicative needs. They don't need a grammar and they don't need a teacher telling them how to conjugate verbs in order to reach that level of communicative capacity. But we, because a lot of the schooling around the world has been developed in order to impose um, colonial languages on indigenous populations, that has been done through the, the uh, overvaluing of yeah of grammar drills and written materials absolutely so when you value um a local language and you value the socialization process through which that community has uh, acquired and communicated through that language over centuries or millennia then one can be a little more humble and say okay um the dominant or majority language can come side to side and we can develop and we should develop um additive multilingual strategies right exactly exactly rather than um impose the written over the signed or spoken uh the dominant over the local uh it, and and creating those very um artificial but also very damaging strategies now, um, one thing, another, I mean, another, so that is happening in places like Mexico. Uh, one thing that is very interesting in the US context, there's a, a lot of different, very interesting things, it, but in terms of research into bilingual education is that it has been shown that um, children, multilingual children acquire language uh, at different rates 
uh, and acquire competency at slightly different rates than monolinguals. So if you measure the performance of a monolingual child and a bilingual child in terms of reading skills or math skills or um, the size of their vocabulary at any given point. And you do so within the first, let's say, first three years of elementary school, you will see that the monolinguals might outperform the multilinguals to some extent, not, not a huge difference, but to some extent they do. But when you make, when you continue to evaluate uh, these children uh, and give them six, seven years, then the multilinguals actually outperform the monolinguals. And in fact, they do so in the two or more languages that they are being that they are acquiring. So you see this in th th there, there's a lot of work that has been done, for instance, in the California school system, uh, which is the largest school system in the United States and, and has a lot of linguistic diversity because the population is very diverse. And so um, in places where the, the instruction has been at least bilingual, meaning using another language such as maybe in, uh, Spanish or French or whatever uh, as language of instruction in addition to English, then the bilinguals will eventually over six, seven years outperform the monolinguals. So it's a matter of giving the children the time to acquire, you know, twice as much as the monolingual, because that's what they are doing when they are using two languages in the school context. Um, now, those models of bilingual education are indeed limited to very few languages, maybe Chinese, Japanese, um, Spanish, French. Um, but they're, but within indigenous communities, they are doing something, you know, similar approaches to incorporate the indigenous language into the schools within the territories of the indigenous peoples. And they have developed a number of strategies to validate that those bilingual skills, for example, the biliteracy um, uh, seal, which is awarded to children who develop um, communicative skills in an indigenous language in addition to English. Um, so those are really promising um, uh, in initiatives. It does give me hope that uh, yeah. if that was applied in different parts of the world, then maybe something like the rate of dropout would be decreased in, uh, you know, at least in some schools. Absolutely. And actually, on that topic, I wanted to um, mention that that it is also very well documented that in cases where the, in the, the community's language and the community's cultural knowledge is incorporated into the school system, um, the, the students will have much greater rates of completion. So we have seen that uh, for 30 years documented in the Hawaiian school system, which is very extensive. You can go from nursery school to your PhD, sorry, the PhD in Hawaiian, and of course, within a bilingual uh, context system. where the, the individual becomes proficient in Hawaiian and English. And in English. But the high school and the college uh, rates of completion, especially at a high school level, uh, high school dropout rates in the United States are very high compared to other parts of the world. But for example, in the Hawaiian school system, um, the high school rates uh, of completion are very, very high. Uh, I was also reading a couple of days ago a study on um, the a specialized uh, college program for members of the Miami tribe of Oklahoma at Miami University. The university itself is not run by the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, but um, the university and the tribe have a 50 year old partnership. Actually, they just finished the celebrations of the 50 years of their partnership. And part of their partnership is to provide scholarships to um, members of the tribe to uh, do their four year degree at, the, at Miami University. And once the tribes through their research center, the Miami Center um, developed 
a comprehensive language and culture program that was added to the uh, regular uh, classes that the students take in college, then the completion rates went through the roof. Um, and the, the, the four year completion rates, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's it's close to 100 percent from 56 or 60 percent that it was a couple of decades ago when they didn't have that language and culture program incorporated into the college experience. That is amazing. I mean, that's yeah. something that should be promoted and showcased everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. And that is the sort of, um, you know, evidence that validates the need for uh, linguistic rights, because by recognizing um, and just take, think about this for a second. So uh, you started the podcast by referring to human development, to socioeconomic yeah. development. Yeah. Uh, the United Nations uh, has um, fostered uh, a set of uh, objectives for human development, and currently those are um, encoded into the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. That, the 17, uh, are they 17? Yeah, 17 goals of human development. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if you look at them closely, the word language only appears once in the context of a, the non-discrimination clause, which is essentially copied over from the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If you dig through, for instance, um, goal number four, which is a quality education for all, um, the language, the concept of the local language and the language of children, mother tongue, mother language concepts are not even mentioned. And yet we have re research that shows that teaching in the modern language will um, dramatically improve the academic outcomes. So why is that relationship between mother language and education not articulated explicitly? So maybe that is... that it, it's time to do it and it's time to do it hopefully in a, Declaration of Linguistic Rights that might come out of this um, this decade. This decade, exactly. I mean, this this. I think we need to keep reminding people that there is no education without languages. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the medium for teaching is a language or languages. You know, depending absolutely. on what happens in the classroom. Absolutely. There's no economic development without languages, right? Absolutely. And there's no social or political harmony without languages. Absolutely. So we do everything with languages, right? Languages are the strongest and the best tools we have for communication of knowledge of everything. So it's, it is surprising. I think every linguist who looked at the, you know, sustainable development goals, you know, the 17 goals and, you know, would be surprised and was surprised to see that you know, language is, is not prominent, does not feature prominently, you know, as a, as a tool that will be promoted uh, to, uh, you know, to, um, to reach those goals. But yes, let's yeah. hope that, you know, in the next 10 years, you know, the error would be corrected. Hopefully, hopefully. Again, again, it comes back to, you know, our issues on, uh, of, on human rights, right? Language rights. And on that, we probably finish with that by going back to uh, something that we talked about, you know, in a previous recording. And that was, you know, the practice that consisted of taking away, you know, the children of, uh, you know, uh, well, members of communities, language communities, you know, in the Americas, it happened in Africa too, and in Australia. And, you know, the children were taken away from their families, from their communities, and were forced to live in boarding schools, right, where they had to, you know, uh, they were assimilated completely, you know, they were indoctrinated into a new way of life, you know, forced to speak another, a new language, and they weren't allowed to speak their own language, they would be mistreated and punished for speaking their own languages, right? How is the situation right now? This happened in what the 18th, 19th century? Did it go into the 20th century? 
uh, in the Americas? Yes, well, in yeah, well into the 20th century. Okay. Which is which is crazy. Quite, you know, we were alive it. in the 20th century. Yes, it, very it's, much so. It is. It this is something that happened. Uh, so, I, I before I respond to your prompt, um, I do want to acknowledge that this is not my family's life experience. It's not yeah. an experience that okay. I have firsthand knowledge in, and it's a, an experience that is really incredibly painful for those um, who have. Uh, that experience in their families. So whatever I say next, um, I want to do it with humility. Um, and I want to make sure that I do it uh, in recognizing that um, I could potentially be downplaying or misrepresenting the, the, the extent to which this experience has been traumatic, to say the least, to community after community after community. Um, so with that said, um, yes, it is very much the case that the experience of the boarding schools are in people's, present in people's lives at this time because um, it was the experience of grandparents of people who are now in their teens or, and 20s. Uh, maybe even um, older than that. Um, and it was a, an experience where um, I, I said at some point uh, earlier in the podcast that language has been used as a tool of uh, discrimination. Um, in these contexts of um, boarding schools, the boarding schools the, the, were used as an excuse to disseminate uh, to, I'm sorry, to decimate these communities. They destroyed their, the family units. They abused and beat the children on grounds that they were lesser people because they were um, the, the people that um, the settlers were trying to dominate. Um, thousands of children died in the care of these so-called boarding schools. And if our listeners are interested, there are reports, uh, very harrowing reports issued by um, the Canadian government and the US government, uh, very recent reports. It's amazing to think that these atrocities happen in the 20th century uh, and that we're only now it, you know, having access to proper reports based on proper investigations. Um, when children attend, attended these schools and were told and beaten um, and abused for speaking their languages and practicing their cultures and wearing the hair the way the, their communities wore their hair and wearing the clothes that their communities wore that their mothers and grandmothers made handmade for them, um, there is a level of destruction of your self-esteem that, that you can see generations later remains a part of uh, the challenges that these uh, that native communities are facing. Now, having said that, um, what is incredible is that despite the 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 damage and the harrowing nature of these abuses, um, the communities are still there. The communities are practicing, um, their cultural values, engaging in their knowledge systems, uh, revitalizing their languages at whatever cost, right? Some communities still have their languages and they are working from that point onwards. Other communities no longer had speakers of the languages and that didn't matter. Their, the strength, their resilience is taking them in the direction of engaging in whatever long-term effort to revitalize their languages because they know they matter because um, mm. they see the value that uh, they see what these languages did to maintain cohesion, to um, maintain knowledge transmission, um, and, and they're willing to engage in decades long work to bring them back into community use. So I think that uh, perhaps as we narrow the end of our podcast, I want to be sure that our listeners know and are 
um, enticed to learn more about the abuses, but that they also use that experience to recognize um, how resilient and strong and creative indigenous communities have been and continue to be. And that is, to me, the, the reason why my work is so amazing. Um, I get to see that strength of spirit firsthand. Um, and it's, it's something I can devote my professional life to without a question. That's really inspiring. And uh, one last thing, where can we find your work? I mean, where can we follow, you know, the sure. work, your academic work, but also your, you know, uh, your research engagement in uh, the communities you work with? Well, thank you. Um, I am better at talking about uh, the importance that of linguistic diversity than about keeping my lab's website up to date. <laughs> Um, I do value open access uh, in academia, um, and so I do make my work open access. I, I have some works that are published in non open, that on, on uh, venues that are behind a paywall, uh, but there are I, I no longer engage in that, and I make sure that my material is uh, open access as frequently as possible. So my work is often on academia. Uh, .edu or ResearchGate. Um, and the website, if you Google the Language Revitalization Lab at the University of Oregon, I promise I'll update it in the next few months so that that's a good place to find some of the work that, at, that I'm doing, but also that I'm doing in collaboration with other committed people like communities in this region or the university, students in the university and communities uh, back home in Mexico as well. Thank you very much, Gabriela, for coming back to uh, the University of Manchester virtually. <laughs> and uh, I hope to have you back very soon for another discussion on uh, issues relating to uh, endangered languages, language reclamation, and uh, everything language. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You. Well, thank, thank you, you for the invitation. All my conversations with you have been very stimulating, so I appreciate the opportunity. It's an enormous pleasure to have you here. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Before we go, remember that there is no education without language. There is no socioeconomic development without language. There is no meaningful political stability without good language management. Remember also that children and adults can function perfectly with multiple languages. So be a proud multilingual. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on our social media platforms, and see you very soon for another episode on the Multilingual World Podcast.